Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hey, all. Welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Go subscribe there. Uh, simply an email will get you access to a 31 31- page PDF on the top 200 drugs. Great review resource, study resource, uh, whether you're practicing or a student going through pharmacology classes. So definitely go check that out. All right, let's talk about the drug of the day today, and that is ezomeprazole. Brand name of this medication is Nexium. I definitely see it used fairly often in clinical practice. Uh, It is considered a PPI. What is a PPI? Proton pump inhibitor. And mechanistically, uh, this drug inhibits, as the name says, inhibits proton pumps in the gut. And those proton pumps pump hydrogen ions, which increases the acidity and reduces the pH of the stomach. So by blocking those pumps, uh, you're going to raise uh, the pH and reduce the acidity and hopefully help treat symptoms of GI conditions such as uh, GERD, uh, generalized dyspepsia, heartburn, uh, Barrett's esophagus. Uh, We're going to use these medications for GI prophylaxis, uh, peptic ulcer disease, so lots of different uses that you're going to see a drug like ezomeprazole used for. Uh, dosing of this medication typically ranges in 20 to 40 milligrams once daily. Uh, under rare circumstances where we need more aggressive dosing, um, worsening symptoms, uh, significant disease state, uh, such as uh, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, Barrett's esophagus, uh, you might see up to uh, 20 to 40 milligrams twice a day. Now, administration, this is a question that I definitely have been asked about quite a bit by nursing staff and and other folks. So um, do we have to give it before meals? And I would say ideally, that is the best. You're going to get the best results, the best efficacy um, per manufacturer recommendations. Now, are there people that, you know, get out of bed and they want to eat right away and they, you know, want to take their... Uh, PPI at the same time as as their breakfast, that type of thing. Um, yes, I've certainly had patients do that. Uh, but from an efficacy standpoint, it's probably best to do it at least 30 minutes, um, probably ideally up to an hour before uh, eating uh, breakfast or whatever the case may be there. So uh, again, that maximizes uh, that drug being able to be absorbed and to start shutting off Uh, those pumps that pump that acid into the stomach and cause uh, some of the symptoms of of heartburn and the irritation and that type of thing. The other question I wanted to address was definitely uh, reassessing length of therapy and then kind of coupling with that, how do we uh, reduce or try to get people off of these medications if we feel like their symptoms have been controlled and things are going well. So, uh, first off, you, you definitely want to continually reassess these medications, okay? Whether they've been on it for six months or two months or, you know, a couple weeks, we got to have that reassessment period that we're thinking about and should be in your documentation if you're a provider uh, and if you're, you know, a pharmacist helping out manage medications, that type of thing. We, we've got to make sure we're, we're readdressing this because these drugs do have you know, other drug interactions and long-term potential adverse effects, which obviously I'll get into. Um, But we want to minimize the dose and minimize the duration. So if you've got a patient taking it for generalized heartburn, um, over-the-counter recommendations is 14 days. Uh, So patients uh, are recommended to stop taking it after 14 days if they're using it uh, on their own for over-the-counter purposes. So that should prompt them if issues are coming up still to uh, go get 
reassessed by a qualified healthcare professional. Now, if you've got GERD uh, symptoms, been officially diagnosed, esophagitis, uh, we're going to try to heal that up and, and get rid of the irritation and maybe the pain and discomfort associated with that GERD. Uh, and ideally, in that four to eight week range, uh, up to eight weeks, uh, we can maybe try off of that PPI uh, and you know, hopefully they won't need it on a long-term basis. But again, really, really important uh, to make sure we have those dates and times that we want to look at that medication uh, and reassess it because I just uh, cringe <laughs> at how many people I see, uh, geriatric patients I see on PPIs. I mean, the percentage is, is very, very high. So definitely do the best you can uh, to make sure we're, we're reassessing um, a drug like ezomeprazole uh, on a chronic basis. And there are situations, certainly, where, where chronic therapy is justified. So, uh, you know, Barrett's esophagus is a, a great example there where, yeah, we're likely going to be on life-term therapy in that type of situation. All right, uh, tapering. So how do we taper? Well, there's no 100%, you know, well-studied way to taper uh, PPIs. Uh, most will kind of judge it based upon how long they've been on a PPI, as well as maybe the severity of their condition and, and disease state. So those are kind of the, the two things that, that I think about, how long they've been on it, you know, what are their symptoms, what do they look like clinically, and what's the diagnosis um, that they're using the medication for. So I would say most uh, in my clinical experience will target the one to four week range for dose reductions. Um, reductions might range in the range of, you know, 25 to 50 percent, uh, kind of depending upon, you know, what dosage forms are available and, and what makes sense. So if you've got a patient, let's say, uh, on high dose Nexium for, you know, significant heartburn or something, but we want to try to taper that down. Uh, so some might go, you know, from 40 BID just to 40 once a day. Um, and I, I wouldn't say there's anything wrong with that. Some might go from, uh, you know, 40, 40 BID down to 40 milligrams in the morning and 20 milligrams at night, you know, for a week or two or something. So definitely no set way to do it. Uh, just think about that, that patient, uh, maybe how touchy their condition is and how worried they are about it. Um, and, uh, you know, but I, th I think the, the important point is that um, if we don't feel like they need it long term, uh, let's let's get after it. You know, however fast or slow that is, let's start to try to taper and reduce uh, if possible. Again, uh, Barrett's likely a long term situation where they're going to be on long term PPI. Uh, Zollinger Ellison syndrome, another one where we're probably going to have long term therapy there. Uh, patient education. So if you're working with a patient that's been using a PPI over the counter, maybe them doing it for a long time, um, it's important to assess those folks uh, for kind of alarm symptoms. And I think about unexplained weight loss, um, maybe like worsening stomach upset, nausea, vomiting, that type of thing, uh, significant GI pain. Um, that's maybe, you know, not typically associated with uh, heartburn type symptoms. Uh, and then ble bleeding, of course, is definitely an alarm system as, symptom as well. Uh, adverse drug reactions. Generally, PPIs are pretty well tolerated in the short term. At least that's been my experience in practice. Uh, but we do have some longer term issues. And that's why, you know, reducing and trying to um, get patients off these medications like ezomeprazole uh, is important in the long term if we can do that. So uh, long term uh, impacts, risks, uh, low B12, low magnesium levels, uh, potential association with increased fracture risk, uh, C. diff infection, and potentially other GI infections as well. Uh, there's a, a recent one out in the last year or two here about uh, maybe an association with an increased risk of uh, IBD and those type of, of diseases. So, uh, And there's uh, been rare renal issues as well uh, associated with uh, PPIs. Again, a lot of these are very, very rare uh, and not incredibly common. Uh, so we've always got to weigh that risk benefit of continuing a PPI long term for reducing GI symptoms versus what are you know some of the other risks and adverse drug reactions that I, I mentioned. Uh, kinetics, uh, it's broken down primarily by the liver. 
uh, the kidney does not play too much of a role in uh, basically shutting off the activity of the drug. So renal function changes generally aren't a big deal as far as dose adjustments, things like that. Um, it's more uh, broken down by SIP enzymes and things like that. And the primary SIP enzyme is 2C19. Definitely something I've seen uh, come up on various pharmacology exams and, and board exams for sure. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like BCPS, ambulatory care, geriatrics, BCM, TMS, the psychiatric exam, or the NAPLEX exam, go check out meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. We've got a great list of resources there, uh, tons of information, uh, study guides, question banks, all that good stuff. So uh, go check that out. Support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. Uh, if you're a nurse, med student, physician, PA, uh, we've got a growing list of Amazon books as well. Uh, so different study materials, case studies, drug interactions, lots of different resources that can definitely uh, help you become better at medication management if you struggle with that. So again, all those links, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All right, wrapping up with drug interactions, I've got to talk about clopidogrel first. Uh, I've been asked about that numerous times throughout my career. Uh, so the, the deal is ezomeprazole inhibits CYP 2C19, and clopidogrel is activated by that enzyme. Now, the clinical significance has been very uh, controversial. Um, it, it's been back and forth on whether we should or shouldn't use these drugs together. Um, I've uh, done a whole blog post on this uh, relating to omeprazole. Uh, so definitely, uh, if you Google search that, Meded 101, omeprazole, clopidogrel, I did it several years ago now, but I still feel like there's no consensus on how significant and if it's clin clinically significant. Um, so my best sense is, you know, looking at strategies to potentially get off of ezomeprazole, if that's a possibility, um, and there are potential options to switch to uh, other PPIs that may have less of an interaction as well. But again, it's uh, controversial as to uh, how clinically significant it is. Um, the end result of that interaction possibly, like I said, um, is reduced effectiveness of clopidogrel, which clopidogrel is used to prevent heart attack, strokes, things like that. So um, th that's kind of the, the challenging part. And the risky side is if there is clinical significance to that interaction, um, we certainly don't want to put our patients at risk for heart attack and stroke. So again, very controversial. Uh, if you Google search Meded 101, Omeprazole, Clopidogrel, I've definitely uh, laid that out a, a little bit better as far as potential options to address that interaction. Uh, citalopram is broken down, so that's uh, brand name Celexa by CYP2C19. So Isomeprazole inhibiting CYP2C19, we can increase concentrations there. And if you remember, uh, Citalopram uh, is one of the higher SSI. RIs for contributing to QTC prolongation risk. So uh, definitely pay attention uh, to that one. And it is recommended if patients are on both ezomeprazole and citalopram uh, to max out that dose of citalopram at 20 milligrams. Uh, a couple enzyme inducers, uh, St. John's wort, rifampin, they can reduce concentrations of ezomeprazole. Uh, one other uh, important interaction I wanted to specifically mention. Again, uh, as always, it's not a total extensive list of drug interactions that I go through uh, in this section, but some of the ones that I think are most uh, kind of consequential or, or you see most often in practice. So one last one, uh, isomeprazole reduces uh, acidity in the stomach, and for some medications, they require a more acidic environment for adequate absorption. So end result of using a PPI like ezomeprazole uh, with some of these other agents could lead to reduced absorption and reduced concentration. So uh, some examples here, uh, iron, uh, cefiroxime, which is an oral uh, cephalosporin. Obviously, it makes sense that it's got to be oral because we're talking about gut absorption. And if you, yeah, change the uh, pH of, of the stomach, that could alter uh, absorption of, of pretty much only oral meds. Uh, IV meds aren't going to typically be affected. 
uh, HIV meds, uh, itraconazole, mesalamine. Uh, again, the HIV meds, atazanavir, I believe, is one of them. Um, not used very often, but I think it's important to uh, maybe double check and look at that if you know uh, a patient is going to start ezomeprazole uh, and they're HIV positive or taking HIV uh, medications. Uh, with that, I think that wraps up the podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. Leave us a rating review on iTunes, wherever you're listening. Uh, So greatly appreciate that. It helps us grow the podcast, helps us reach more people. So definitely take the time to do that. Uh, Share us with friends, colleagues, uh, emails, uh, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, Instagram, whatever social media platform you use. Definitely uh, feel free to to share us there. Support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Uh, If you got comments, suggestions, mededucation101 at gmail.com. Otherwise, you can track me down on LinkedIn, Eric Christensen, uh, PharmD, BCPS, BCGP. All right, that's going to wrap it up for today. Thanks so much for listening. Take care. Have a great rest of your day. At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial-grade supplies for every industry with same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help so you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.